real life stories, candid interviews, deep questions. Inspired by the horse, Equest Radio, horsepower for the soul. With Cynthia Royal and Leah Juarez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Equest Radio. I'm Leah Juarez, and I'm thrilled to be with you today. And I'm Cynthia Royal, and we're here to share with you what we think will be an incredible journey. Equest Radio is a show about women who love horses and other animals. It's how that's inspired them to find the courage, the clarity, and commitment to supercharge their own inner horsepower. This episode's about clarity, often the first step to honing in on and pursuing your life's dreams and goals. But what does clarity come from? What does it look like? And what do you do when you finally find it? Well, today we've got a special guest for you, author, philanthropist, and Emmy award-winning newscaster, Robbie Timmons. And hopefully she'll help us answer some of these questions by sharing parts of her own special life journey. Hi, Leah and Cynthia. Thank you very much for having me on. Hi, Robbie. It is such a delight to have you. We really, really appreciate your time. And um, you have been groundbreaking throughout your entire careers. Have you always had a very clear vision of what you wanted to do with your career? Well, I, I think I had a goal. Um, I'm not sure it was such a vision. There, I've always set goals and then kept changing my goals. Um, because when you set out, you're not sure exactly what you're capable of doing, although at, at the time I think a lot of us think we can do absolutely everything. Um, so as, as I progressed in my career, I kept changing my goal, um, you know, hoping to do something a little better, hoping to make myself better. Um, I was never satisfied with the status quo, never satisfied with the story that I just finished. Um, the, the best story to me was the story I was yet to do on, on the newscast. So uh, and I was an anchor for um, WXYZ TV in Detroit. So I've been in the Detroit market and I've been in the Michigan television market for um, almost 39 years. <laughs> so, oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, so I've had, I've had quite a few goals. And as you mentioned, um, I was honored to be the first woman in the country to anchor the evening newscast at 6 and 11. So... Um, that that was uh, it was a, it was something that just fell upon me. It wasn't necessarily a goal, but um, and I think for a lot of women, um, they ha- you have to be ready for the opportunity when the opportunity arises. So yeah. Now that was up at that was when you were up in Lansing, correct? Correct. And um, and then you also went to Michigan State University. Actually, I went to Ohio State University. Oh my goodness! Oh, <laughs> I know. Goodness. We, which coming to Michigan, when I accepted the job in Michigan, my family from Ohio said, of all the states, you have to accept the job in Michigan. Although uh, now they've all come around, and of course they love it now. And as uh, a matter of fact, my brother has moved to Michigan, um, and I married Jim Brandstetter, who uh, was a University of Michigan football player and is also a sportscaster with the University of Michigan and the Detroit Lions. So uh, football yes. and Michigan football is a big part of my life. Yeah, well, I was just going to say go green because I am a Spartan. I'm a Michigan State oh. Spartan. So, yeah, so we've just got all kinds of dynamics going on here. But We uh, do, don't we? <laughs> and I know we're going to talk a lot about horses, too. But yeah, exactly. you mentioned, well, that was, oh, go ahead. You mentioned clarity, and, um, mm-hmm. and I, I think um, sometimes it's hard to get clarity. Um, but I think, I, I think when you, you feel something, when you feel passionate about something, um, like I started feeling passionate about helping horses and helping horses, uh, thoroughbreds especially, find homes. That all, all of a sudden was my clarity. That became clear to me that that was the passion, and that became a new goal for me to, to step up and see how I could help them even more. Yeah, and yes. that's a really important point of you felt something, and, and that feeling led you to pursue something else. Correct. Correct. Did you, um, and, I, and 
I'd love to get to the impetus of that, um, uh, that particular story that you did that led to that. But previous to that, did you do any an other animal stories, um, you know, whether they're about horses or anything else like that, that kind of really rang true and resonated with you uh, during your professional life? Oh, absolutely. Uh, matter of fact, around the newsroom, if there was any animal story or wildlife story, they know that they would give it to me because that was my passion. I, I loved animals and worked with the Humane Society and, and uh, did a lot of stories on wildlife, uh, traveled to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, did a story on bears and the wolf recovery in Michigan, how the wolves were moving back into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and would soon be migrating into the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. Um, I've done stories on deer, um, the Detroit Zoo, um, and I think a turning point for me was I had the opportunity to interview Monty Roberts. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you know him as the horse whisperer. You know, to me, he's a real horse whisperer. There's uh, several out there. Um, so, uh, so I did a story on Monty Roberts, um, and when he was visiting in West Michigan, I didn't know anything about horses, so I'm sure that he thought I was asking some of the most stupid questions in the world. But, um, but to me, it was a real education because I didn't know those answers. Um, and I put that story together and watched him work with these horses, and it was, I, I, it, he just took my breath away, and the horses took my breath away. And he's working with thoroughbreds, and I just, I suddenly really fell in love with the thoroughbred because to me they. They just, they look like the, the top equine athlete, and, and I, just, I just really admired them. So, you, so previous, to, previous to that, though, you really had no interaction with horses or? No, no, not at all. I, I didn't, um, I, like I say, I really didn't know anything about horses. Uh, matter of fact, one of the stupid questions, that, and you, you horse people are going to understand this, that I ask him, I says, well, well don't the foals, um, you know, because we were talking, obviously, about breaking the horse. Don't the foals just learn that from their mothers or from the herd? <laughs> and of course, they don't. <laughs> you know, but, but to me, I don't know that. You know, I'm thinking, you know, that, that an animal is going to learn, you know, how to take a rider or how to, um, you know, be broken just from being in a herd or just from watching uh, other horses. And, of course, mm-hmm. that's not the way at all. It has, each horse has to have their own individual attention and but that, but but that interview with with Monty, that wasn't that wasn't the uh, you know the the kind of aha moment that led to Cantor, which we'll we'll talk about in a bit. It was actually the the story about the Detroit race course. Could you tell us a little bit more about that story? I will. Um, yeah, with the Detroit race course uh, was a thoroughbred race uh, race course uh, in the Detroit area. It had been operating for decades, just very, very successful. I have to admit I'd never been there before. Um, and someone came up to me and said that they were going to close and they had a great idea about putting these horses on the website so the prospective buyers could find these horses because thoroughbreds were easy to retrain and through jumping, dressage, eventing. Um, they're an athlete and they're just a great, great horse. And unfortunately, if they needed to find homes for over 200 horses because they were not fast enough. They were not, the trainers and owners could not transport them to other racing facilities. And there really was no option for these horses except going to slaughter. I mean, and that was the fact. And here are three and four year old thoroughbreds really with no options unless somebody could step in and start finding them homes. So, um, so I worked with this woman, and we went to the to do this story, and we went to the backside of DRC. Had never been on the backside of a racetrack before, and um, you know I'm a little intimidated by all the thoroughbreds sure. because you know it, it's it, I'm totally out of my element. But um, the turning point for me was during the story. I felt fed a carrot to the granddaughter of Secretariat. Now I knew who Secretariat was. <laughs> and this horse, this is one of the horses that needed a home. And um, make a long story short, we did the story um, and followed it for the, the several weeks until DRC closed. And we found a home for every one of those horses. And I thought, you know, to me that was the turning point because I said, you know, this program really works. Um, all you need to do is get the information out there. We would take descriptions of the horses, pictures of the horses, put them up on, on the Cantor, it's C-A-N-T-E-R, Cantor website. And um, I'll mention that right now, CantorUSA.org. That's our website. Um, 
and and um, and so we we would put those pictures and descriptions up there, and um, then prospective buyers would contact the trainer directly. Um, so was was Cantor was the organization already in place then when you did that when you did that story? So you used it. That it as was not. We we were putting it in place as we were doing mm. the story, and um, and I I immediately became involved. And I said, you know, this is something I, I really want to continue with. Uh, DRC is closed, but they were opening another track in Michigan, in Muskegon. So um, I said, let's continue with this. Let's find a volunteer on the west side to help us work that track. And um, I made, you know, trips on the west side of the state, doing walking the back side of the track as well. Found a great volunteer with a farm over there. And, uh, and then, then the need started changing very quickly in that um, we had to start taking the horses off the track immediately because they just weren't running fast enough, racing the business. They needed that stall for a faster horse. So we started actually taking the horses off, and actually Cantor owned horses then, and we would find them homes ourselves. So we would do all the rehab, retraining, the marketing to find an approved, a canter approved buyer. We came up with an approval sheet so that, uh, you know, somebody who says, gee, isn't that horse pretty? I want to buy it. Uh, we had to make sure that they knew, uh, right. you know, how, how to train a horse, how to work with a horse, or at least that they had um, the, the capability of finding a trainer for that horse. Robbie, this is Cynthia. Um, for our Hi, listeners, Cynthia. for our listeners that aren't, really um, up to speed with how the, how the racing industry works. What happens with horses that typically don't perform, that, that don't really make it in this endeavor? What, what are the options um, before um, well, someplace like Cantor? Well, uh, before Cantor, there really were no options. Before Cantor, um, the, there were slaughterhouses open in the United States. And... Um, the you know I, I'm not putting down trainers or owners because um, some of them if they could they would take them to a farm, but they had a business to run and um, they would have to send them to slaughter, uh, where the kill buyer would pay them the meat price. They were treated like cattle, where the kill buyer would pay them the meat price for that horse, and um, people may not know this, but the horse meat is not used for anything dog food or anything like that it's a gourmet food overseas so the horse meat would only be shipped overseas as a gourmet uh, gourmet food item uh, for the european and some of the asian countries right so and that, um that still does exist today right i mean canter's it, canter's making a significant um impact on on placing horses you know rejobbing horses but the, that whole industry does still exist right the industry exists to some extent. The slaughterhouses in the United States have closed, uh, but they still exist in Canada and in Mexico. Um, but I think the, the attitude of the racing industry has changed dramatically in that they see that, um, that there are options for their thoroughbreds when they're not competitive, when they're, they don't have to be racehorses. Uh, we get horses now where the trainer will say, you know, he or she, they just don't want to race. They don't want to run. They don't. They're not competitive. They're just. They just don't want to race. And I don't want to force them to race until they break down or, or have a racetrack injury. I'd rather you find them a new home now. That is happening all across the country. Since Cantor started in 1998, you know, with the the full organization. Um, we started expanding from Michigan into Ohio and uh, Pennsylvania, the mid-Atlantic states, New England. Uh, you can go to our website. We're now all across the United States and California, Arizona, uh, Gulf South, and wow. Kentucky. Um, we have transitioned 15,000 thoroughbreds, yes, which is absolutely to... amazing. It and really basically, is amazing. And to, to me, I think we put the slaughterhouses out of business, you know, because we, because it, for thoroughbreds, and because we we have given them options, and the racing industry is recognizing Cantor. We received some national awards, which is great, and which is is just a means of recognition, which uh, we really appreciate. Excellent, and there's there's so much more. We're going to take a really short break, and we're going to come back and talk to Robbie Timmons more about the wonderful work of Cantor and also her book. So stay with us.